Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, is there any way to get the light on us down a tiny bit? It's a little hot. But we can We're do it. We're hot. We're hot. <laughs> um, uh, so today we're, we are here to talk about Rebecca Quaitman's work and the exhibition upstairs, R.H. Quaitman, Morning Chapter 30. Um, we will, um, you know, Rebecca and I have known each other for a long time and we have kind of a, um, a, a very casual um, uh, banter. Ban banter. Um, and, and apologies in advance if it's too much like banter. Um, but we will try to have a conversation about um, things that we need to talk about and things that you all might have questions about. And uh, then we'll open it up to you. And maybe um, we'll ask you some questions or you can ask us some questions. Um, okay, so. Should I just sort of give like the thumbnail thing about the, yeah. what the show is? Okay, the, the exhibition which we've been working on for the past couple of years is... Um, in a way, uh, kind of the, the biggest museum show that uh, Quaitman has had, in a way. Um, most of her exhibitions in the past have been kind of single chapter, single project exhibitions. Um, chapter, this word chapter uh, comes up all the time because it's what Rebecca calls her exhibitions. Um, you know, like the chapter of a book. Um, I think sometime 15, 16, 17 years ago when she began to develop you know, the way of working that she is now known for, um, she decided that she wanted to kind of make a, uh, a working method for herself that would allow her, her art to be not, not so much driven by individual exhibitions or individual paintings, but be a kind of ongoing thing. And so this, this word chapter um, uh, came into play. Um, if you think of chapters, um, there are always going to be many of them, not just one. Um, there's chapter one, there's chapter nine, there's chapter 16, there's chapter 30, like we have today. Presumably at some point there'll be chapter, you know, 36, 42. God willing. God willing. Chapter 906. Um, it will... <laughs> you, you, you started it. Um, uh, it goes on. And the way that, um, you know, you're, maybe at some point you'll go away from it and you'll stop doing these chapter things. And maybe that's no, something. Maybe, that's oh, no. Enough. Well, okay, so chapters forever. Um, in other words, the art practice becomes like, you know, a, an analog or a parallel to one's life. Uh, it goes on as long as you do. Um, and it all adds up to what we might, if we're going to use this terminology, we might call a book. Um, the book of an art, art, uh, an art practice, the book of an art, uh, the book of a life. Um, we can talk about this, this terminology a little bit if it bugs you or uh, if it seems apropos. Um, but I want to talk about this chapter, chapter 30, uh, because it's, it's not just an individual, um, it's not just an individual show for Mocha. It includes a lot of other work from other chapters as well. It's more synthetic than uh, previous exhibitions, previous chapters that uh, Quaitman has, has made. Uh, and it's, you know, at some point early on in the process, we thought that we were gonna be making a kind of survey or a mid-career retrospective even. Uh, and we abandoned that idea. Um, Not really, I, I don't think so. You don't think so? No, I think it's a survey. It is kind of a survey, yeah. but, but it's not like a traditional comprehensive survey where you have something from everything, something from every chapter, so to speak. Um, it's it's it, the, the, the new work that you were making for MoCA, that you wanted to make for MoCA, began to take center stage. Yeah. And the other stuff that we included in the show um, kind of grew around it and sort of fell into place around it. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing. It's, it's work from lots of different periods, but it's centered on a, a new body of work. Um, so let's, let's talk about this. Oh, the other thing to say, uh, just as a, as a, as a um, just, you know, uh, the other prelude is, is that the one thing about chapters is that, um, or one thing about the way Rebecca works with her exhibitions is that the, the projects are kind of site specific. Each show is kind of about the place that 
the, the work is shown in, um, a response to the place in some way. It could be, you know, um, the, ge the, the, the geography of a place, it could be the history of a place, of an institution, it could be uh, work in the, in the institution's collection. Yeah, but it also has to sort of now, the problem becomes more that it has to make sense with the previous chapters. That's right, it's an arc. So I think, I think in my mind I was thinking that chapter 30 would in a way be a, an attempt in my mind to sum up the last 10 chapters since I'd done this, this big show, which was at the same size space as this space, yeah. called Spine, and, and that was where I, I basically made my own retrospective by re, reprinting images from the first 20 chapters and tried to kind of, you know, see what, what, where they're leading or where I want to direct that? this thing. That was like thing. 2010. 2010. So, because um, I, I, it is important to me to always keep <clears throat> the development and the and the kind of idea that there is a narrative, in a sense, with the with these I, with the issues that keep coming up. So. So there's like there's certain subjects that I tend to go back on. One is, I, I often look at a collection in a museum mm -hmm. and the artists that are associated with it. Mm -hmm. But then also, it, it, it was very poignant, I guess, moment for me because I had just finished these, I would say, a, a very intense geographic mm -hmm. uh, circuit between Vienna and Chicago and Israel and Brazil mm -hmm. and those all brought me to other kinds of ideas that in in a sense I had to digest in this chapter 30 and and keep directing it you know like there is a direction in a sense I mean are you able to say what the direction is not yet almost uh, yeah, it's. I'm trying to say it in the paintings. It's really hard to put it in words. But, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but I do. I do want there to be a a, a connection between every chapter and the mm -hmm. and the the latest group of work. If you if you're able to, I mean, I have my own opinions about this. But if you're able to sort of pull back and look at at your work and look at the kind of subject matters or themes or or ways of painting that kind of continue to pop up in your, in your art, um, what, how would you, what would you say about them? What, would you, well, what, what are they? I'd say in the last sort of five years, it became increasingly a situation where I knew that after this group of work, say, for example, I knew while I was working on um, the Brazil chapter, Otopico, that I had to start thinking about and researching the the group of paintings for Tel Aviv. And so they all start informing each other and using the same kind of bibliography and reference. And um, so there are these sort of strands of subject matter that go through all the chapters that, that reappear. And, and, and OK, so let's jump to this chapter, chapter 30. What, 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 what is the main subject matter? Well. I mean. The landscape. The landscape, yeah. the idea of a landscape, and um, uh, I just, I, I love the idea of just the historic idea of landscape painting and, and what it means philosophically and mm -hmm. what, a, what a, a landscape can be and what it is and why we would, would like to look at them in paintings. Yeah. Um, and, and to kind of, to the, the, the spark for that was your visit to Double Negative. Yeah, because I never, I never did a road trip, you yeah. know, in America, yeah. and I never was in the Southwest before, and so I used this opportunity to go last Christmas with my son. We went, uh, we landed in Vegas Christmas Day, mm -hmm. and we rented a car, and we just started driving, and it was just so gorgeous, the Southwest. I was really, really moved by it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there was the problem of filling that space. Mm -hmm. 
and I wasn't interested in the space here that, at Mocha. The yeah, the that space. room. Yeah. So I wasn't really interested anymore in in, in making a kind of sentence of paintings mm -hmm. from the past. Mm -hmm. I became more interested in this idea. When I had the idea, because I saw the the Warhol shadow paintings first when I saw the space. And originally I was going to be on the other side, but then it switched and and I was like, oh, I'm in that space. And that's where I got the idea to try to really make a long connected painting like he did. And and what we have up there is a single work really that's comprised of 22 individual panels um, that, you know, has this like long uh, horizon line. It's just a big panoramic landscape painting. Um, and on the left side, the, 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 the first six, seven panels, there is silk screen um, of, kind of photographic imagery that, that stems from the desert or stems from double negative. You can actually see the landscape in a photographic way. Silk screened in gold on, on, the, on the surface of the panels. But then it sort of disappears sort of ceases, the painting evolves as it keeps going, and what happens? Well, um, the, the interesting thing to me was that it was really impossible to make a drawing for that panorama. So I, I couldn't understand where it was going until I started, and I started literally just on the left-hand side and began, and and then I would do the next painting, what would be the logical painting next to it? And then what would be the next, and then the next? Because, so I, I, I thought for a long time it would all be uh, like double negative, trying to stitch it together as if it were one scene, but then I got worried that it was a little too like David Hockney-ish, you know, the way he, he does those photos. Yeah. So all, I, I don't like that. Also, it's not really about double negative. Well, I, mean, I did do a lot of reading about double, and it is about double negative too. Yeah. Um, but you didn't want to just represent double negative somehow. I didn't even know. Yeah. I didn't know what to do exactly, but I, I just started making it, and so I found what happened in really very much in the making of it, which was really great. I love that feeling, like that, oh, you just have to start painting, in a sense, to understand where the painting's going to yeah, go. And yeah. your studio in, in New York is not nearly as big as that room, and, and you were never able to have all the panels no, laid out. No, I so never saw like it. You worked like two at a time, mm -hmm. three at a time, and then you could hang them kind of seven at a time. That was like the biggest length you had. Yeah. And you, I remember going in there, like you'd have three rows of seven stacked up, but that's, you, that's a grid. That's not a it, line. I know. Um, so, so it wasn't until we installed it that you saw. That's, that was the first time I saw, yeah. Which is, that's kind of crazy. To work on something uh, both practically, literally, and then just mentally for a year and a half, and then you don't get to see it until the very end. Right. Well, I also thought, I thought that they were all going to be sort of dispersed, so I had to make every painting function. What do you mean dispersed? You know, I, I, I thought that they were going to be for sale separately, each painting, because that seemed probably what would happen. Yeah. But they are sold now. That was a surprise that I wasn't expecting, because I really did make them with the idea that after this, this exhibition, they would scatter. Yeah, yeah. So now it's, now it's much easier to think of them as one single work. Yeah. Um, and on, another feature that I like uh, uh, is the big lacquer wedge, yeah. the, that geometry that comes in from the right side, mm -hmm. I guess? Or yeah, it, I the know. left side. No, the right side, the right, yeah, side. The right side. Well, it's hard, it, either mean, it comes in from the right side or it starts in the middle at a vanishing point and then grows to the right side. It's hard to say which way, what direction it goes. But, right. Um, it's this kind of glass-like reflective surface. It's lacquer. Um, what was your, when did you or how did you decide to start working with that? I, I just, I always am interested in reflective surfaces, and so uh, a friend of mine, uh, Rochelle Goldberg, mm -hmm. said, oh, there's this lacquer guy in my suit. And so I said to Peter, my assistant, uh, let's, let's just see what that looks like, a lacquer thing. Mm -hmm. And so we had one made, and we brought in the studio, and everything just like fell off the floor compared to how good that lacquer painter look, painting looked. It looked like, you know, 
No, it looks like a TV. It's super seductive, or yeah, t yeah something. Or a computer it was something screen, that or... hadn't been in my studio yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's foreign in a way. Yeah. And so, we had to meet it with the, uh, with the gesso, and by by polishing the gesso, very high degree. So, what are the materials in in that painting? Is there any oil paint? There is some oil paint that I paint in the middle. Yeah. So there's very little painting done. It's very almost like like micro, microcosm in the macrocosm. So mm -hmm. in the center, there'll be paint. The, but the little, on the horizon line. Yeah. Yeah. On the horizon line. Yeah. And then otherwise, it's gesso. Otherwise, it's rabbit skin glue gesso, which I've always used since mm -hmm. the beginning, and I always continue to use that. Tell people what gesso is. That meant if well, gesso is what you have to put down on the wood so that the paint medium doesn't rot the, the, the support, basically. So if, it, if you just put oil on wood, it would rot away. So you have to, you have to seal it. Sort of prime it. You with, have to prime it. With the, with with, the gesso. But many people use acrylic gesso or whatever gesso. I mean, there's many different kinds of gesso. But I've, I've, I grew to really love the quality of uh, r very traditional rabbit skin glue gesso because you can put pigments in it. And also, it sucks up paint in a very particular way. But then there was this funny thing that I thought, oh, I'm not painting when I'm doing the gessoing. Mm -hmm. But then more and more, the, the gessoing part became more and more important. Yeah. And I finally had to face it that those were paintings, even if they were just gesso. Yeah. It was like a way I could just say, the painting hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I remember <laughs> at some point, you were just like, I'm not, I'm not. This isn't painting. I'm not painting. I'm just I'm yeah. painting with gesso. I really That's thought, not painting. Yeah. <laughs> I really, really rode on that illusion for a long, long time. Yeah. Until finally I had to face it, that it, it was a painting. And one of the things that the lacquer does, and even to a lesser extent that the gesso does, because it's kind of polished or burnished in a way, and it's, it also is reflective, but what, especially the lacquer part, um, it reflects the room. Yeah, that was, that was my idea. Because... Uh, I knew that I had to make a, a, like a discrete selection that it would be like a sentence to sum up the last ten chapters, and then, you know, to, to, to I I don't know to get the get at the nugget or whatever of 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 those that the last six years or whatever it's been and yeah. and so, but then I started painting that painting and it took over and that was the thing I lost interest in everything else basically but making that painting and I know. and I couldn't even figure out that little wall until we got there I know at no, all it was like an improvisation it, it really was that bit. yeah and it's very delicate to figure out those those walls it's, I mean it's as important as painting the paintings is to figure out how the paintings are hung yeah. to me yeah and I mean, you, do you always work like that? Do you always conceive of your exhibitions as kind of, I mean, I know you do, but I'm asking kind of rhetorically, as, as installations? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely that they're, well, they're, they're the artwork, the installation is a really integral part of the artwork. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And that perhaps is why there are no labels on the wall? Yeah. You know, not to, just to, just to kind of keep the, keep the totality of the installation um, intact rather than kind of breaking it with the institutional yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, poking of the label. Yeah. Um, because it's also very much related to the architecture yeah. and the funny architecture of this building, which is very specific and demanding in some senses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you... Um, so pull back, bigger question. How did you begin to think about um, your art making as both painting and installation, or dealing with architecture? Like what? what? Well, because I think I, I worked as a curator at PS1 for yeah. a long time, and I worked with this curator named Chris Durkan, and I was mainly basically like program coordinator or something, but I learned so much working with him, and we, we worked on... I found out about like Paul Tech and Otisika and um, Cadere and conceptualism and Dan Graham from those like working at PS1 for literally just three years. It really was my education, totally. Yeah. And, and I learned to hang a show then. And so I love hanging, I love hanging different work together. Nothing, I love to do that. Your own work especially. Actually, I prefer to do somebody else's work, but... <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and, and you also worked for Dan. And I worked, well, yeah, because uh, when, when I worked at PS1, the first, when I got the job, I don't know why, he, I was just answering phones. Yeah. And he hired me, basically, probably because he could dominate me, because I knew nothing. And so I, uh, but I got this incredible, and I grabbed it. And then, and then I happened by luck to hear from my father that Hilma F. Clint, we could get a show of her work at PS1. And so I did, and we mounted a big show at PS1 of Hilma F. Clint in like uh, 89, I think it was. And Tell people who Hilma F. Clint is. Do you, know, do you all know who? No? No? You need to know. After this, go look her up, because she's a really incredibly interesting artist. Um, Swedish? Swedish, although that's not really what's interesting about what yeah. What's interesting about her is she was one of the first people to make very large abstract paintings. She was the first, like her paintings are huge. And she painted them on the floor. And this is in like uh, 1917 or something, very early. But she's been very dismissed because she was a theosophist, right? She was, and so it's spiritual and she, you know, believed in the spirits coming. But I actually don't believe she believed in it quite so much. Yeah. Or she, anyway, it worked. Whatever she used to get where she was going, it resulted in some very beautiful works. Um, and so you were able to do, you learned about her from doing that show. Yeah. yeah. Well, I learned about it from my father who told me about her because he knew I'd love it. Your father was a painter. My father was a painter, so yeah. he brought me back the catalog. and. And then, and then, but the funny thing was on the top floor, Chris did his first show at PS1, and that was a group show of, of artists, and it was called Theater Garden Bestiarium, yeah. and all the artists had had worked together to make this very beautiful show, but it was complicated, and it was in the dark, but everybody, it was about the idea of the, the theater garden, and where the idea of the museum originates. And, where uh, does that? I can't, I can't, well, can apparently you, it begins in the garden. In the garden, like in the Renaissance. Yeah. Yeah. About the, I mean, the idea of, I guess, the museum. Yeah. I mean, that's what. Don't quote th me on that, but anyway. <laughs> so I, I learned about all these artists while he was in Salt, and that's how I learned about Dan. Yeah. Because even if, having grown up in the New York art world, I, I knew so little. Weirdly, I was in a little like group that was a little isolated from Europe and other ideas that were going on. But then you went to up. Europe quite a bit. I mean, you went, to, you went to Paris and you went to... Subsequently to that, to after that was... I went to Paris after that show. You went to, to St. Petersburg. Yeah, with the same program. I went to this school called the Institut des, o des Arts Plastiques and uh, it was this really amazing program started by Pontus Holton, Daniel Buren, and an artist called Sarkis, and they decided you know, to reinvent art education by inviting 20 artists for three separate months over a year, and you would just go and talk. Mm -hmm. There was no studio practice, but, I, and Buren interviewed me in Finelli's in Soho, and he said, you speak French, don't he, you? And he I interviewed said, oh, to get into the French. program. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't really speak French. So I got there and I just, that was tough. What year was that? 89. 89. And then, but the last, our last session, we went to St. Petersburg yeah. in 89, and that was really a turning point in my life to go to that city for a month. And then they needed my English because the Russians only spoke English. Huh. So that was a relief. Footnote Pontus Holton founded this museum 10 years Footnote. prior to that. Yeah. Um, in 1980, 79 yeah. and 80. What do you want to talk about? Oh, we're doing pretty good, I think. I think we're all right. <laughs> I mean, it was very comp. One thing I will mention about the show is that, like, this idea that it should be a survey show began to really grate on me, and I didn't, I, I, I didn't know how to think about it. But the, the reason the idea stuck was because I had one chapter that had been sold intact, because most of my chapters are dispersed. And this one chapter was this small group of paintings I made for the Venice Biennial. And it had been bought by one collector. So we were able to borrow back an entire chapter. And it was a small chapter. And it was a chapter that seemed very connected in many ways to everything that had subsequently come after it. And so the, the print I have in the landscape 
re refers back to that. This is the Emodi. chapter called Emodi. Yeah, um, 21, I think. It's all mixed in upstairs, so it's not like that one chapter um, is, is presented as a, our original idea was that we would present yeah. that one other chapter as a kind of facsimile room. Of the installation. Of the installation, but that was, but then the room stuck way out yeah, into that, the that space. Yeah, that became kind of impractical, and it didn't. There was no way to do it in any way, kind of arbitrary. Um, and uh, so you don't see that upstairs. There are a lot of paintings from the Venice chapter, but they're all mixed in with the other right. things. Right. But you know, as as we were, <clears throat> as we as your new work began to cohere over the past six months, um, and the imagery of it and the kind of motifs of it came sort of started to bubble up. Um, it began to seem like kind of almost the opposite of the Venice chapter in mm -hmm. some way. Like the Venice chapter was about nighttime. This chapter was about morning. The Venice chapter was foggy and wet and dreamlike and full of sex. And the, the, Not full of sex. Well, there's a little bit of sex. sex. Full of is mm -hmm. relative wow. in your work, I guess. <laughs> if there's one thing, it's full of. But um, uh, there was sex. In yes. It. And in the morning chapter, there, there, there are not that many people. I mean, there's, there's, not that one. Many, there's one human figure, mm -hmm. kind of way deep buried on the horizon line. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they began to seem like, you know, kind of opposites or, or two sides of the same coin. Um, but I was able to, at the last, like the last month, I figured to put that, the painting on the painting in the, in the, yeah. with the print. Yeah, why did you do that? Um, you know, just working. I find you just start working with materials and then the the paintings lead you, definitely. They lead you and then suddenly it clicks like, oh, that will bring these other paintings back into the context, right. so. Right, and you do, but you do that often. You stack, stack paintings mm -hmm, or put yeah. paintings on a shelf. Yeah. Is that just to kind of? Well, it's just like they are in the studio. That's how like ideas occur when you just see them laying, you know, on the floor stacked against each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, it's always a, a very uh, fruitful compositional kind of technique for me. You once said that that the tension in your the kind of eternal tension in your work is between language and image, or between I mean you could extrapolate and say between books and paintings. Um, where what is where does that come from? Um, I just, I'm interested in, in legibility in art, and so you, I'm interested in, you know, that kind of aha moment you can have with painting, like when suddenly you get Cezanne, suddenly it's like, yeah. <laughs> like a, yeah. a thing in your brain, yeah. and you don't forget it, it like changes your brain. Yeah. And, uh, but so. I think your story, your anecdote is, is, is about, like, um, seeing paintings stacked up in racks, in a storage facility and just being depressed, like, God, that's the death of paintings. Um, they just go to die wrapped up on racks. And books on a shelf were so much nicer looking. Yeah, they seemed, it seems okay to collect books, but not okay to collect paintings. So, um, yeah. I always talk about that, it gets, I, I just, it it's so depressing, it. What's the thought depressing? The th of all those paintings in storage. Yeah. People say that they love in the Broad the, the storage room because they can see they into can see the into uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I all, all love going to me storage rooms and museums. Yeah, I really do. I love that, and uh, I find things sometimes to work with in that way. All the time, uh, the, our registrars hate it, but you know sometimes when we're doing permanent collection shows, you you, you come up with a checklist in advance and you bring all the stuff up and you look at it on the walls and you go, ah, oh, that's that is not working. That that stinks. And so you got to go kind of down into the vault yeah. and, and pick things. Exactly. You um, have to see them. You have to see them. Yeah. Um, and you go down there and you don't exactly know what's in the vaults or you can't remember or things are yeah. placed in different places. And um, it's, yeah, you just, I, I always have this, um, it's, it's like a, uh, it's, there's so much potential down there. Yeah. And the way the, like the weirdest paintings will be hung together on those weird Absolutely. wire things that then they make this whole other sense yeah, like, that wouldn't you know, happen Carol in Dunham the museum. next to Elizabeth Murray, next to Kreber, next to Well, that whoever. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, perfect, <laughs> sense. <laughs> perfect, perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, your next chapter is, is 
is still a ways away, right? It's it, a year from now. Uh, yeah, that might. Be. Maybe I might do Documenta, but oh, yeah. I might. might only just do a few paintings for that. Well, anyway, your your next one of your next chapters is in Vienna at the Secession, and it's about the Amazons in some. Yeah, sense? I, f I I discovered by accident through some art historian friends that in the in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, which is one of my favorite museums in the world, by far I love this museum, and apparently hidden behind walls in this museum were these two very large uh, 15th century paintings on these big wood panels that depicted, one was depicting the Amazon tribe of Amazon women getting together with, I can never remember how to pronounce the name of this other tribe that begins with an S and them uniting, but it's the Amazon women basically, they come together and there's a lot of pubis and pubic hair and it's just like nothing you ever see normally from that time. Really? <laughs> well, they were never shown, these two paintings, and uh, the other one is from this uh, story by Plutarch about on the bravery of, of um, Persian women where the, apparently there was this m maybe history, true, true event where they went to defend the city uh, and and uh, they were losing and they ran back to the city but all the women raised up their skirts and said you can't come back from you can't go back from where you came <coughs> which seems a very complicated idea to me but it's just a shocking painting because they're all standing there holding up their skirts and all the horses are going like ah it's hard. <laughs> so there, these paintings, I have a little Polaroid of one of them, and then there's one in... Well, yeah, that's why I brought it up, is because it yeah. appears in this show. Yeah. Um, there's a painting in Chapter 30, Morning, that features a, 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 a kind of oblique image of, or a rotated image yeah. of, of that painting. Right, that Van a Vienna detail of that detail painting. A detail of that Van Vienna painting. Yeah. Um, but it turned out that I could have access to these paintings and watch them and use images of them being restored. And, and I financed the restoration of them by selling a painting to pay for the restoration. What? You did what? I sold a painting to pay for the restoration of the two paintings. The, and the museum let you yeah. do that? Because oh, you, yeah. <laughs> they definitely let me do Because they were you very wanted happy to see those paintings. And yeah, and I want to use them. Yeah. That's amazing. So, as a subject. But... It's then going back into a kind of much older history, yeah. which is also problematic. I don't know how do you do that exactly. Yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, I mean, the subject of history in your work is 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 rich. I mean, there's a lot of allusion to um, to older paintings and to yeah. older, you know, <laughs> previous eras in art history and painting. Um, how did that? Is, well. I, don't, I, I don't just really, really love there, to look at painting, old you, paintings. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you became a kind of connoisseur. Well, I mean, not really, but an eccentric, a, one, a, a lover of, yeah, an art lover. You yeah, are an I'm art an art lover, lover to, pretty much. Yeah. That's scary. I know. <laughs> then you're gonna have to accept that. <laughs> um, whoa. Whoa. What's that? Oh, that's the whoa. But it, something happened. But it looks good. It's the Angelus. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a little iPhone snapshot I made an hour oh, ago of, 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 the, the, of the vitrine. Oh, I see, yeah. Um, there is this vitrine in your show where a lot of, actually a lot of the historical references for your work are present, mm -hmm. um, as well as kind of diagrammatic, a diagrammatic um, presentation of chapter, of the installation upstairs. Right. Um, what's in there? What is that? What's well, I, don't, I mean, I just accumulate a lot of things in sort of researching chapters and subjects and books and ideas, and they never get shown those things normally. I never show drawings or. But you do draw. I do draw, but I never show my drawings except I do. You did a couple in there, and you never show your dream. Polaroids. Have you shown your Polaroids? Not much, but yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And the catalog, since we didn't know what the paintings were going to be, yeah. the only option I had really for the catalog was to show the Polaroids. So. That's right, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, 
just because they're not seen much. They're not seen. You know, museums when they make books for shows, the 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 the, the timeline and the schedule for production of of a book is, you know, it's way in advance. And when you're doing a show like we did, where a lot of the painting is being made for the show and might not be ready uh, in time if for the until the opening, um, how do you illustrate the book if the new work isn't available to use as illustration? What do you do? And Rebecca had this idea of, of um, not illustrating the book with paintings at all, but um, of, of using all of your Polaroids. Polaroids, yeah. And... Because um, every chapter has a series of Polaroids that I, I use often for the right, silk screen. Right. And it's be I mean, I love the way it turned out. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny, none of, the, none of us, the writers, um, really knew exactly what the show was going to be yeah. when we were writing. So you kind of tiptoe around it. They, yeah, that was hard for you guys. It wasn't hard for Yves Lambois uh, no. or for Juliana Reventish because they know they're just going to write what they want to write. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me because I felt a responsibility to, to kind of say what the show mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Just in a kind of flat-footed institutional way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's okay. Yeah, it worked yeah. out. There's, you know, no one will know the, the extent of the untruths in that book. <laughs> 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 What do you mean? Well, there's just a lot of untrue information. Oh, like this painting will appear? Or yeah, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's not that much. It's mostly, mostly factual, that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't we... Why don't we um, do you have any questions for the audience, Rebecca? No, that was a joke. Okay. Mean. Well, does the audience have any questions for Rebecca? We'd be happy to take yeah. questions. Yeah. Oh. oh, and wait, there's a mic that's going to float around. So could you um, talk a little bit more about how you decided which chapters to put around this chapter mm -hmm. in creating this exhibition? How did you make those Do decisions? Do you have anything to say about that? No, go ahead. What do you mean? <laughs> you gave me such a look. No, no, what? No, no. I mean, it, it was a... I mean, that's a, obviously a, a basic, legitimate question. Um, but it's a hard question to answer, um, I, at least for me. Well, you, it started out with a very big checklist that we were going to borrow a lot of things. Yeah. Like, you know, I had this, I mean, just since we're, you know, since we're telling truths here, um, I, I had this idea early on that I wanted to make a survey of Rebecca's work. And like I wanted there to be this and this and this and this and this chapter and all the chapters and here are all my favorite paintings and here's all of the correspondences between my paintings and um, I think at, at various moments I would show it to Rebecca and she would go like I don't uh, I don't know how that is going to be possible you know I don't know how that's all going to make sense with the new work that I'm focused on and still trying to figure out and in the I think in the end the the paintings that we selected um, were kind of like um, uh, just were paintings that were like deeply personally um, important and relevant to yeah. us. Um, yeah, I mean, in like some sense, it's a without. kind of attempt to get at a, a logic of a, a kind of story. Um, there aren't that many loans in the show. I mean, there's a lot from you. From you. There's the emoji work. Well, um, I didn't want to borrow things that I n knew had to be in the show if we borrowed them. Right, because you needed to give yourself the freedom. To, yeah, to, I needed, because right. often, always, I bring many more paintings than I end up hanging. And so that's just how I work. Like, I see it in the space, what will work. So I needed that flexibility, I think, yeah. partially. Yeah. No, there's a whole thing about autonomy, like the artist's autonomy in your work. Like, you, you, it's your way, right? It's your way. It is kind of your way. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, but it doesn't make it, it doesn't, it makes it hard. It does, yeah. yeah. I know. Um, or it could make it totally easy, too. Well, yeah, like I can just, just sit back. Just went with it. <laughs> um, it's a good thing I know you. I know. Um, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's kind of like you... George Lewis, the musician, the kind of jazz musician, free experimental jazz musician once said that you kind of, you know, the definition of improvisation is kind of having all of the particulars there on the table, 
um, as givens and then just kind of knowing what to do with them. And so in a way, like, um, I gave up on the idea of having this kind of um, big survey thing um, pre-made almost mm -hmm. and had to accept the idea that these things would show up and they would be givens and we would make the show with what we had in front of us. Right. And that was like liberating also. Yeah. And also I knew, I knew that the landscape would carry a lot of weight, you know, that it right. wasn't going to be such a demand on the other idea. But in the end, I think it works well, and uh, and I did. We did manage to get really important paintings, and um, yeah, there's a group of amazing paintings from that were that are owned. Well, there's the Brazil, oh. but then the Mumak, the stuff from from Vienna. That, that you was showed. really that that Vienna show was really important to me because it was a kind of chapter that attached the chapters to come after and yeah. and the ones before. It was like a a way to try to begin figuring it out, the narrative. <laughs> that, a curator asked that question, by the way. <laughs> a good curator, very good yeah. curator. Yeah? Um, I'm interested in the situational specific aspect of your practice and the chapter sections, and I'd like to better understand sort of the terms of transfer or repurposing of work? If it's a situationally specific chapter section or project, how is that show or how is that body of work right. then shown again in another situation, in a different situation? Uh, well, there's a two-pronged answer to that. One is um, I paint them all so that in my mind they can function alone, like as detached from the other paintings. But um, in a way, I always think that they're not, they really aren't at their best when, they're, when I'm not hanging them. Like it's like plugging them in when I put them in. in it's almost like plugging them in like when I, when I hang it. Because it's then I activate them in a different way outside themselves and that's what I like to do. But the other thing is that I can, because a lot of the imagery is made with silkscreen, I have all the films that I ever made and can re-deploy re an image if I want in another context. So they can be repeated motifs. For instance, there's a, there was a painting that you made for an exhibition in Germany in Mönchengladbach mm -hmm. that included this, this image of the silkscreen image of a, of a kind of auditorium like this, like this. Just yeah. like this, filled, filled with people, all awaiting what? Boyce. It was an opening of one of his first shows, Boyce. Yeah. And he's in the front row. And um, there's this book. But I loved it because when I originally did this image for the museum that, the, that I'd found the photograph in, I put everyone asleep in the painting. And it was so pleasurable to do that. Like you painted their eyes I closed. shut their eyes. Yeah. That was. And, and right. And, I love that. And because you liked that so, so much. So much. You, 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 there, there are three works in this show yeah. that use that image. Yeah. But none of them are the original painting from Munch and Gladbach. No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I love that image. I don't know. It's, it's just the audience, I guess. It's a reflection. And also because they're all looking. They're looking at something specific. And you feel like, what, what are they looking at? At, and that, so I, I always like kind of paintings that are in some way function as an arrow outside themselves, I would say. And that's why I like that image. Eric, is that, uh, uh, what, are we answering your question? Maybe we didn't get your question. What? Well, I mean, I, I didn't understand it was a two-pronged approach, which you said. Mm -hmm. so, and it, it sounds to me that there's a preference too, in terms of. Of which images? Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. There's one, images that, that keep arising. And maybe I'll start reusing images more, I'm not sure, maybe. But I also, weirdly, am beginning to paint more, which There's is a lot more uncomfortable for me to admit, yeah. but it seems to be happening. There's a lot more free, like what you might call free painting. Yeah, yeah. which I've been very allergic to my entire life and avoided, uh -huh. like the plague. For what reason? 
just for the for the reasons that a very you know, yeah, yeah deep reasons yeah. I don't know yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean I don't know yeah the, the, well, go ahead do you have a question Ma'am? Well, a comment and a question. I think that your talk about the artist process and how that elucidates your content is really refreshing to hear. And then my question is related to that, mm -hmm. um, because it seems like in your work there's a lot of um, unveiling of the materials. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about your choice of materials and your choice of representing the subject matter and how you mediate it, because in some instances it's printed, in some instances it's painted. Right. And then sometimes on the same image there's both the material itself and then a representation of that exactly. material. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the choices you make there and then how that both reveals and then also you direct the content that uh, comes from those combinations. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing was that when I realized I could make a silk screen and use a photograph, it was just such a relief that I didn't have to paint something and depict it, that it would work as fine that way that I could use a photographic image or based image. But then I realized also I wanted to deflate the power of that image because they can be really blinding pictures and photographs to anything else. So I particularly like the silk screen because it weakens it. It weakens it and also it's also weakened by the way I print on that gessoed surface because you see the brush strokes often of the gesso underneath the dot pattern. And so it sort of scrambles it, and you're not sure. And it, it, de it, it, it makes it flat, basically. So that's how it began. And then uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, I, w I was joking. I always, the gessoing became more and more elaborate and careful. And I start the whole idea of a chapter with what I'm going to do with the gesso, and if there's going to be a pattern in the gesso, or what colors the gesso is going to be. Um, and then. I had to realize that, that they were actually were just paintings. But it was an amazing trick I did in my mind to say they weren't paintings, they were just gesso. But it was, sometimes you just have to do a trick like that to get forward, you know, to get over something you're terrified of in a way, I'd say. That's what I'd say. Anybody else? Um, I, a few years ago, I heard you speak at USC, and you were talking about um, biomorphic imagery that showed up in your earlier work. And I was wondering, as you were just talking about free painting, if that, if biomorphic, how imagery, are you talking about process, are you talking yeah. about imagery, which category would you put that into? Well, I, I, I do, I am able to make a painting with a brush and paint when it's a small, small panel. But I, I never was able to do it in a big way, like in a gestural way. Like I'm not interested in my body and my arm when it comes to making a picture so much. And, uh, and actually you can see that in the landscape because still, even though it's very, a very big expanse, it's still the painted part is pretty tiny and with a pretty small brush in general. So, uh, uh, but I really love to paint very s concise images on these smaller paintings that I call captions because they, 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 they're another register in a lineup of paintings that's slower, it's, it's a different time to look at them and they kind of, I, I say they're, they're, they're almost like punctuation marks or something. They have a different, they're like a beat because usually they're black too, and they're pretty simple. And I've seen images of them. I I love them. <laughs> Thank you. I do too. I, I love painting those paintings. There's, I really love painting them. But I couldn't make one big. So well, you don't make anything big, really. I mean, oh really? I mean, I mean there's that big thing upstairs. <laughs> but but that landscape's pretty big. It is pretty big, but it's comprised of panels that are not necessarily yeah, that big. Yeah, that's the biggest size, yeah. It's the biggest size. I mean, that's something yeah. we talked about, is the size of your work. Yeah, well, the originally I just wanted, you know, your basic painting size, like a like the platonic idea of a painting, like, is basically your arms, that's the painting size, it's like that. 
And so I started with that dimension and then didn't go far in either direction. Anybody else or um, or we can all go? Yeah. Thank you Good. for coming. Yeah. Um, you can ask me after. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca's around and um, uh, thank you all for coming again and enjoy your Sunday. <laughs>